from some juvenile who is arrested and maybe dismissed uh, and any sort of charge, it appears that he then goes into the gang, the criminal gang database. Uh, we just had three young men for life right. uh, because they were part of a criminal gang. And the gang they were a part of was a rat group called yeah. RIA. Yeah. Yeah. You start trying to get into it and information requests. How do you know these guys are in a criminal gang? Well, somebody said, or oh, we saw a mugshot or something. Uh, except they're not being that definitive. Right. It turns out that they get a larger grant from the feds if they have more more people in the criminal database yeah. or they do better when they prosecute them. Yeah. So we're getting into their pockets now and that's where he's trying to get open record requests turned into some real problems. Yeah, and I don't know if any of you, if any of you crime reporters have had much experience with that or not. I've heard very cursory conversations about that. And, um, in fact, I talked with a, a, a police chief the other day about how broadly the word gang is being interpreted. Well, the, the statute in the code talks about criminal street gang, criminal street gang terrorism. And so these three young men, the indictment went out with the jury and had terrorists in the, the bill of materials seven times for each of them. Yeah. So they, you know, these are... Thank Homeland Security. Yeah. You know, and I, I agree, that's a very frustrating thing. I don't know that I've got an answer at all. Okay, what, who haven't we heard from? Um, We've just been waiting. To... Right, my situation is a little different from all these. Uh, it's not probably with open government, but a uh, dishonest uh, elected official. Imagine that. Uh, yeah, I know it's one of them. Uh, I'm Bobby Gerhardt, I'm from Macon. I was the former uh, chief appraiser down in Gwynn County, which is Brunswick, St. Simons. Uh, on my way out, I suspected that there was a problem with homesteads down there, and I thought that there might be maybe 100 or 200 that were done incorrectly. Uh, it turns out there's 6,000 mm -hmm. out of the 18,000 homesteads. Uh, basically, Glenn County is overcharging those taxpayers uh, money for ad valorem taxes. And basically, uh, I sent all that information to a local attorney. They had a lawsuit. Uh, the local judges recused themselves. Uh, Judge McLean came down to hear the class action argument. And that was over a year and a half ago. Uh, he hasn't decided yet. Meanwhile, the three-year statute on recovering ad valorem taxation overpayments due to a factual error is running. Uh, the taxpayers are losing homes because they're having to overpay on their taxes and other problems. But uh, in essence, I evoke my uh, fifth estate uh, right. Uh, I know y'all are familiar with the fourth estate. The first, first three are clergy, nobility, commons, fourth estate, media. The fifth estate is now being called the bloggers oh, or social God. media. But that's what that's what they're saying. So in essence, I put up a website, uh, GwynCountyHomesteads.com. Had all my spreadsheets on it. Uh, did a lot of activity. People are, are going to it and finding out they're being cheated. Right. Uh, they're going to the tax commissioner's office and complaining and she says that her records are correct. That, uh, and, and she's partially telling the truth because she's relying on a data entry person that was in the tax assessor's office who used the wrong base year. So we have this problem of she's stonewalling until she gets out of office in 2016. Meanwhile, these people are overpaying since 2001, it's over, I, I quit figuring in 2012, and it was $11 million. Uh, it's probably close to $15 million. How many, uh, I, I want to talk a lot about this. How many homeowners you say have paid? It's 6,000 out of 18,000. How many of those have networked with you and uh, following the, the we're, site? We're getting, and involved we're getting probably 500 a day going to the website. Okay, let, let me tell you something personal in front of you. You're doing exactly what we're talking about. And it is an open government issue. And, and you are building the network. I mean, honestly, this is a real testimony to everything that, that we've been talking about. Now, I don't know, and, and 
I don't know what the, what the legal triggers are here. I don't know if this is in the court system now, how that affects the, the clicking time. A lot. You know, I, I, I'm not going to be able to talk about that. I, and, you know, without more information, I don't know, you know, I always going to have more information about that. But you are doing the very kind of thing that we're talking about by raising awareness. I would like to think that local media will pick up on this and, and, and attack it and, and help drive that exposure. But this is real advocacy. This is real citizen action and advocacy. It's not just crowing. It's addressing an issue and being very fact-based in the way that it's being addressed and growing a network of citizens <coughs> to, to actually look for a remedy for, for what the situation is. I'll also be interested in, did, did, a, did a lawyer take this up pro bono? Oh, of course not. <laughs> but uh, I talked to uh, the attorney for the county that's handling it, uh, and basically, after a year and a half, I said, hey, what's going on? And he said that this will, it doesn't matter who uh, loses, this conflicting law on uh, class action in abhor and taxation. Uh, so he said that it doesn't matter who ever loses this first uh, class action argument, the other side will appeal until hell freezes over. So that's when I said, well, you know, I've got to, I've got to do something else besides just turn it over to an attorney. Right. And so that's when I did the website. And so they are at least getting their demand letters mm -hmm. for the refund in before the three year elapses. Right. And but they're still being told that the tax commissioner's office records are correct. Right. But but you're 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 preaching. You're you're constantly yeah. telling and I know you I'm not your, because I've, you've got to get your demand letters in. This is the deadline to get your demand letters in. Yeah, exactly. uh, now so far as the legal fees, who's paying the bill? Well the the attorney uh, is using a test case and I don't think there are any fees being paid. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm sitting at a, at a, at a restaurant uh, at lunch, and uh, the bartender friend of mine always uh, introduced me as the most hated man in Glen County. And so the guy sitting next to me, he said, well, what exactly do you do? I said, well, I'm cheap appraiser. He said, well, I, had, uh, I bought a house in those six, uh, my taxes, I figured should be 1500 and they turned out to be almost double. I said, well, they gave me the wrong base year. And so uh, when I was on my way out, I ran into some local politicians down there, just like I did in the county. And, uh, and so I started researching, and it took me three months to go through the records to get those 6000 But I know that they're being cheated. And so this is my only remedy that I know of. And, and your name's on the ballot for BOC chair? Yeah. Uh, no, 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 no. I'm totally out of it. <laughs> yeah, no <laughs> way ever again. I think I think Obi has too to it. How can there be that much of a disconnect? My God, that's just astounding. It, it is astounding. Um, because, well, in the management class, uh, you can you can delegate authority, but you can't delegate responsibility. Yeah. The tax commissioner obviously delegated the authority to the data processor in the tax assessor's office to come up with the right value and tell them what it is. This exact same thing is happening in Union County. Oh, is that right? I'd okay. like to talk to you after no, okay. this, this, is a floating, <laughs> this is a floating homestead, the Scarlet Rooms Amendment in Glen County. And if you're not to be a floating homestead, uh, once you apply for your homestead, say, in 2012, then it's based on the value in 2011. That value is capped. The millage rate can change, so it's a floating homestead. So basically, it was done incorrectly on about 10% of the original ones in 2001, and then about 50% of the ones after that. And the reason why is because we would revalue about 50% of the county every year because of the sales activity. So we, to comply with the uh, Department of Revenue guidelines, we have to revalue. Uh, either hot spot or cold spot, bring the age down or bring the age down. So evidently the data processor was putting in the current year instead of the prior base year. And no one ever caught it. Right. And when and probably uh, at the beginning of very, very honest. It, it, absolutely. But then when I have a taxpayer complain about that to me, I would send them, I think correctly, to the tax commissioner's office because they handle homestead. She would have a hissy fit and 
say that her records are correct and say go back to the tax assessor. So the taxpayer was being ping pong back and forth. And finally they just give up. And, and I'm talking about uh, the people in this group are unbelievable. One of the ta one of the board of commissioners in it, the head of IT, the assistant county administrator, the number two person in HR, Sam Nunn, um, Davis Love's brother, uh, Steve Mellon, who's a friend of mine, he's a golfer. He's being cheated out of $3,400 a year. Uh, and on and on and on. And these people had no idea this was going on. Isn't there, Holly, I'll ask you, isn't there a thing in the, in the Code Section 45 dash whatever, which is tax law, that if over 5% of the people appeal their values, the whole digest stops? There's it, something, it, there's something it, to it, that effect. Yes, yeah, uh, 3%. But I think it's 5% of the people, and if they appeal, I think it happened in Big County. I, I'm sure it happened it, in Hall it County. Everywhere. It happened in Hall County one year, several years ago, yeah. and the whole digest stops. They can't collect taxes. They can't send out tax bills, and then everything has to be done. And maybe if you've got 6,000 things, everybody no, appeal, it'll stop. Right, but this is not an appeal. This is, this is uh, homestead. Uh, still, if they appeal their values and all, right, this it is stops. Not, but it's not. I, I understand what you're saying, but uh, this is not a property appraisal. This this, this is based on property appraisal, but uh, this but is it's history. Exemption. This is history. This is the current value change, and that's when you appeal the 45-day period. Well, why couldn't you go ahead and file an appeal on that anyway? You could. Well, because you're being charged this year. Okay. Uh, this is after this is after their uh, 45 day appeal period has expired. Right, because they had to appeal by April the first or well, something. Like 45 that. days from the date of the. But they can start. They can start January first if all these people go in and appeal. For next year, they'll stop. The whole digest is going to stop. But they're leaving. They'll change really, something. You can get a, you can, a county can get around. You don't. The digest doesn't right. just stop. You Relative to our discussion, what this is about. That, that's why you're here is is that there was some darkness and somebody shined some light on it. Now it really doesn't matter who's shining that light. In this case, it was just somebody that happened to be in the know. Somebody that honestly kind of an insider. There are a lot of whistleblowers out there, but it's up to you to find them and to let them know that they do have a voice. It's not always going to be the local newspaper. I will tell you, it ought to be a local newspaper, but I can't promise you that because too many of them won't do the work. Or for whatever reasons, political or otherwise, they've been told not to do the work. But nobody's restricting you to being the light shiners. I was curious how many of the charts are local newspapers. Yeah, again, again, everybody that's a newspaper person. We had more this morning, you heard this afternoon. You must have. I told I, I told I my group. Hey, I told the, uh, my group at lunch that I had offended uh, lawyers, government officials, and newspapers. So if there's anybody I've left out, please let me know. Okay, but who, who wants to take us in a different direction? Other experiences. I just want to oh yeah, I, I missed you a minute ago. I just want to add one comment to what he said. Amongst the many hats I wear, I'm a tax rep. I go get your property values lowered. And there's some counties I go in, I literally get taken to court by the county because I get the values lowered so much. But what all of you need to do is go get comps in your neighborhoods and you'll find out that 99% of you are 30% overvalued. Yep. And you some better, worse. You better to be your best friend in that. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you know yes. a lot of y'all talk about yes. being, being public enemy number one in your counties. And you may be publicly public enemy number one with members of the board of commission, with members of city council, with people in the tax assessment office, <laughs> but not with ordinary everyday folks that are trying to make ends meet, that are paying their taxes, that are worried about the security of dark lit parking lots in the college campus. At night. <coughs> you know, we have got to do what we do, and I firmly believe this, for the right motivations for the right reason. And motivation does matter a whole lot. For those of you that are in the newspaper business, if you think that we 
are open government advocates, so we can say, gotcha. And the thing I hate to hear more than anything is people say, yeah, well, y'all are just trying to sell a newspaper. Really? We honestly, we can't make a living 50 cents at a time or a dollar at a time. It just doesn't work that way. So I've had a lot of reporters come to me and sort of, they get real frustrated. They say, you know, nobody likes me or they're talking about me or I'm taking the heat or people are, if you can sleep at night, that means if you did it for the right reasons, if your interest was about democracy, about freedom, about citizens, about taxpayers, you don't have to worry about what people are saying about you. Because I guarantee you, you're, you have far more support than you do have enemies. But do make sure that this is about the right thing and not about when. Who else? I'd like to hear from some of the people in Cobb. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, Gary. Well, well and y'all have been at the centerpiece of this issue for a good while now. Yeah, I, uh, looking on the positive side, uh, the greatest thing that's happened with race with Cobb has been the AJC. I have never been a fan of the AJC uh, for lots of reasons, but this young man, Dan Kleppel, has, has shown me and shown the world, I hope, just exactly how important the free press is and how he manages to get a full page uh, on a Sunday edition twice now uh, is beyond me. But that's, if, if you need any fortification for what you're talking about here today, that's it. Uh, the uh, recovery of data, the open records issue, is sort of interesting because the last big kafluffle we had is that uh, our chairman chose to start off this whole thing by talking to a, uh, a sort of a uh, street vendor kind of lawyer. I mean, a very powerful bond lawyer, but he had nothing to do with government. What he had to do with was how to get around the Constitution and do whatever it is you want to do without going to the people. Uh, and our chairman kept saying to Dan Kleppel, no, we, he never was a lawyer. And Kleppel said, well, gee, I got 17 different versions of this document, and he prepared the first five, and his firm's name is in there. Well, he didn't have authority to do that. He never worked for us. Uh, and the last full page blurb that Dan got in the Journal Constitution was a result of uh, the lawyer in question who had lost a $4 million fee for his company over the next few years, uh, had chosen to take an email which he got from the Cobb Chamber of Commerce to his office saying, Chairman Lee says, you're, you're our lawyer. Uh, and that was never disclosed in open records because it wasn't an open record. It came from the Chamber of Commerce to the attorney. So one of the really smart things this very smart attorney did was one day after the article came out, he simply sent it, he forwarded that article with no preamble or anything to several government accounts. The Cobb County lawyer, the Cobb County chairman, the Cobb County, and now they were part of the open records and they had to be produced. And so the lid is blown off. Uh, so I was looking at uh, a uh, open records case I guess it was yesterday, the day before yesterday, where a uh, city councilman was writing emails to a member of the Downtown Development Authority saying how careful he was not to put anything in email. And there were a litany of emails of things that he had said that, that compromised his uh, ethics with respect to the city. So, uh, you know, a lot of times people will They'll say the right things in one breath, but then end up and make the most stupid mistakes. And, and I, I will tell you, the ability to be able to access email is huge. And and uh, being able to, to look at cell phone records and uh, cell phone messages is huge. Because it's amazing that people that ought to know, and they'll just put it on government email. They don't even think about it. They'll just send the email. So it's amazing the, the things that are out there and things that are available. Um, you know, if you take the opportunity to access it. 
Yeah, well then. Until you start asking for it, then they get smart. Yeah, well, yeah. If I'll just do one thing that you I didn't have to ask for. Uh, we have an online agenda for the commissioners, and then they have their meetings, and then the minutes are approved, and the minutes go into another file online. Uh, it turns out that this MOU, the Memorandum of Understanding, was the first disclosure document, and it was full of a lot of junk. Uh, but there was a very essential change made between the time it was presented to the public and the time it was approved, and that change dealt with the intergovernmental relationships, which is how you get around the Constitution. Uh, the, the Cobb Marietta Coliseum Authority wanted no financial responsibility, but that was who the county was going to have to make their agreement with in order to go through the shenanigans, this little shell game. Uh, two days before the vote, the Marietta Coliseum Authority said, we have to have this sentence put in the MOU, which basically said Cobb County agrees to be responsible fiscally for anything that we do in this. Uh, and the email, which we got through open record, said Chairman Lee agrees with this. So then they come to the vote, and the chairman says, well, now this is a modified thing, and the pink pages or something we really ought to talk to Sam Owens about. <laughs> but uh, he talked about two incidental changes, one having to do with a cap on the annual maintenance, and the other one having to do with a, a rail into uh, the stadium. He says, those are the two changes, but I want you to know it's a change document. He very carefully did not mention this uh, global change to the intergovernmental agreement and got him to pass it. Then it turns out, about two weeks later, I'm fumbling around online, and I look at the agenda because I want to look at the copy of this MOU to make sure my recollection is right that that wasn't in there. And son of a gun, it's in there now. Gee, it wasn't in the agenda. I pull out my copy. It wow. turns out they had gone in and changed. And never Not just the minutes, the but changed the agenda to show that it was the way they wound up approving it. Right. Yeah. So uh, I had a friend who happened to have an active ethics complaint going against Chairman Lee. I called him about this. An hour before the close of business on Thursday before Good Friday, he amended his ethics complaint to include the fact that they had changed the agenda to show the finalized item, the fraudulent change. That was an hour before the county closed for Good Friday and Easter Monday and all that stuff. Sometime between then and Sunday when I looked at it, Easter Sunday, they had gotten word of it because he had filed his complaint. They had gone back in and undone it all. <laughs> uh, and I started saying, you know, they learned nothing from Nixon. It's, it's the cover up to get you. Uh, but that's the fact. That's still sitting there. Uh, I went to the DA with it. Uh, he got an affidavit from somebody that says, no, I didn't have it. But you've got the documents. I'm sorry? But, but you've got printouts of both. I've got the documents. I've been trying to go to the grand jury for four months now and been frozen out. So I'm but still there, Another great it. example of what watchdogging does just by paying attention. And even though you may have just been going on to do some cursory reading, it was there. Uh, I think we had something. Yeah. Um, my question was so sort of about the email thing. Um, we've had people write to the school board members at their school board address and get answer back from a Gmail account, which then is not open records yes, request. No, so it doesn't matter what the um, where, what address, private, home, whatever. As long as it's dealing with the public business, it's subject to release under the Open Records Act. Well, Clear, unsettled So, law. so how, how, how with this Chamber of Commerce, they, well, well, how would you get it, though? Because if you ask the school board and you say, we want to have the email between school board members X and Y, it's not on their server. It came it's from Gmail. 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 But it came to a government address, is what it, you're No, saying. no. Uh, as a citizen, a citizen mailed to the school board member at their school county address. The school county board member didn't answer from that address, nor did they copy that address. They answered the citizen from a Gmail account. And I can't answer the mechanics. I'm not that tech savvy, but what I'm telling you is if 
we brought that case, we would win. That is subject to release under the Open Records Act. Okay, but the case, my case was not the chairman sending this message on the Chamber of Commerce. Chamber of Commerce will understand this. Just ask, just ask them for it. The school board they just say no, we won't. They just say no, we won't. So maybe I'd take that one as a private case. Well, I, I can show you um, 10,000 pages of documents. Seriously, and I, I had a stack this high in front of Shirley before they got her. That's what we were talking about. All of her personal emails where she was doing all of this stuff that the FBI had. And I said, Shirley, I've got all this. And that's when she started crying, saying, Oh, well, I never should have run for office. And I'm thinking everybody would have been better off if you had. <laughs> and she were, and all of the other commissions, it's not just Shirley, they've all told me that. And I've got the emails from the other side where it came in, so I have copies of it. So I'm requesting what I already have in hand, and they refused. They just refused. Um, I can tell you what the law is. I know. I can see that it didn't regard it. Well, is different. Well, <laughs> certainly my favorite case for the county attorney fees being paid uh, for a Bring that challenge, but I mean, um, that, that's um, I would say you, if anybody wants to litigate that one, where and when from we email is sent, you got a winner on your hand, and I could probably line you. I probably I shouldn't do it, but a couple of lawyers would be interested in that case. That's you married in such thing as a slam dunk, as Gary and I know young lawyers think they're a slam dunk. That's a um, right. Well, and in, in all honesty, it would only be fair to let you know what happened with my open records lawsuit before anybody would consider that because then they'd probably run. <laughs> it, it probably would not be worthwhile, seriously. I mean, give me a put that regardless of whether it's your case, and I think it's a really fascinating issue, it's something that I had wrestled with all the time where people, I mean, it was a, it was a, it was a smart tactic, I'd say, on some public officials' right. part to try to avoid the Open Records Act by doing that. It just isn't the law. Well, that's actually how I started. I got all the emails from everybody else so that I could prove it, and then they refused it. Yeah. And I really think you'll see the courts consistently saying attempts to circumvent the law is a violation of the law. And... You know, so the point is, were they doing government business? Could, you know, could you get the evidence to bring the case? You know, there, there are a lot of questions there, but it is a record. And well, my own state senator is on record saying that no one will ever win a, an open records lawsuit in Winnet. She won't deny saying that, Renee Arnold. Oh, I'm worried I know you're going to say that. <laughs> um, she really could. Some one of my colleagues is going to get amped up with statements like that. Yeah. I'll Sounds like a great transcript of my last papers. meeting with her. I can give you a, a verbatim transcript of my last meeting with her. <laughs> okay, guys, we're we're getting closer and closer to uh, deadline, which all you newspaper folks understand. So, uh, does anybody have sort of anything completely different or new? or unrelated to these other topics that we talked about that we've not had a chance to. Yeah. Quick, From Gainesville. Quick, easy question. When you request documents, can they redact cell phone numbers? I was going to ask that too. Did the cell phone number reception pass? There was, there was legislation. Um, I didn't think it passed. Yeah, I don't think it Would you email me and I'll look it up for you? When that they redact all the on incident reports. All personal identifying all, all phone numbers, emails, ages also. There was, also. There was a person. bill. There was yeah. a bill um, brought to redact cell phone numbers, um, and I can't remember if it passed. But if you email me, I'll look it up. I'll send you the bill number and whether it passed, and you can use that in your reporting. Then another quick question. Um, I think I was reading in the blue book, like. When you've got an investigation, obviously it's an open investigation, you think it's up. If it's an unsolved murder and it's two or three years later, they're not doing anything on it, if it's open, yeah, they say it's not. It's really funny. Good. So this book is sort of, um, you know, if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, this is probably my pride and joy. <laughs> um, I envision this book as 
it would all be, and I went to law enforcement and I said, I think we're going to have this whole book be about the pending investigation exception. Because everybody in the state interprets it different. Is it a habeas appeal? Does that when it closes? Is it after the And law enforcement all said to me, oh, no, it's very clear what a pending investigation is. I think that that's a closed investigation. You are going to have law enforcement officers around the state argue to you they are willing to face that an investigation is open for federal. I would take the tightest personality and just say, and um, oh, he's right, Athens Banner Herald wrote a case in the past few years that tried to work on the temporal limits. I think it's closed as soon as possible. But there is a very hard line position that they're going to be open. They never saw if they're open forever. To give, to give context to that situation, um, I talked to the law enforcement officer in our county, uh, their PIO. Uh, she told me, just in person, I didn't get it in writing, that they said that they were not going to be open, opening that case or looking at that case at that point. Because it was coming up on an anniversary, so I had to write something. And uh, then after that, I was trying to file a records request with the custodian. The custodian then sent back, sorry, we can't release that at that point. You know, quoted the, the case law back at me. I quoted the case law back to her. And, uh, and then, yeah, well, yeah. And then, uh, and then I got a very, very terse email back that just said, oh, well, GBI is on it, so uh, it's still active. Yeah. Even, yeah. So that's just kind of where it is at this point. I don't, I don't really have a good answer. I just, I personally, and I'd say most media and open government actors would take the position that it's, it's closed almost once they leave alone. But they're always going to close stuff like that. So I don't know that I have any good advice to get around it other than finding a sympathetic and empathetic law enforcement officer. The issue just got a BOIP voice system, which means it just occurred to me you've got a voice system that the messages are being recorded because you get it ordered to you as an email. Will that be covered by open record? Wait, okay. Voice over protocol call system. That your phone calls are being recorded because then the message can be forwarded to you as a sound file, which means they're recorded. So, but the fact it's not. If they don't afford you that email, you still know they're being recorded. Yeah. And if it's not public, it's a public servant, will that be covered by open record? I'd say so. I'd say so. Yeah. I think that's what I'm talking about. reporters. But that's also, George, George, don't, so don't say sorry, anything you don't want. want. <laughs> Somebody to find that, out about it. That doesn't matter for that kind of system. Yeah. This is a communication system paid for by government money. Yeah, yeah. I, I, would, I, think, I think in most cases it would be viewed as a record. Okay. I know that we still have a lot more. We got, you know, a smattering of